the high risk patients, um, they tend to be a heterogeneous group. You're going to have people who are what the Spanish myeloma group folks call ultra high risk that do need to be uh, treated perhaps like, like real myeloma. Um, but uh, we're going to get our answer with, with the ECOG study saga that you're leading, uh, Len versus observation. Tell, uh, tell us about that, Saga. So that's a study that enrolls both the intermediate and the high-risk group of patients as defined by what I'll call the ECOG high-risk criteria, <laughs> uh, which is greater than 10% plasma cells, free light chain ratio greater than 8 or less than 0.1, and M protein greater than 3. And, and what I think we're trying to do, what I think you're hearing all of us talk about is that smoldering patients are a pretty heterogeneous group. And what I think we want to do is identify which smoldering actually have myeloma, versus which smoldering are actually more like MGUS. And that's, I think, ultimately, that cat smoldering will go away as a category. Agreed. It'll be replaced with either MGUS or myeloma. And how to get there, I think, is the real challenge. So, so there have been some attempts to start treating these high-risk uh, smolders. Uh, both the Spanish group has been mentioned a couple of times. Um, Amrita, are you familiar with the, um, the, some of the Spanish studies? Would you like to comment on those? So I think the Spanish studies certainly were very landmark in regards that finally we had a randomized and for trial. And for the people who are watching who might not know what they are, can you just explain what they are a little bit? So the uh, Spanish study that I was referring to was the trial looking at LEN-DEX for two years versus observation in patients, quote unquote, high risk by the various definitions. I think the challenge is the field moves so quickly and when the, that study was developed, for example, imaging, as Sagar alluded to earlier, was not by MRI and PET. So now we look back at that study and say perhaps there are a lot of patients who in fact had true myeloma, in, especially in the observation arm. So it makes that study a, a little bit more in question, which is why in part we're waiting certainly for the ECOG trial. Now, now that study um, is being presented again at this meeting. And would anybody like, does anybody want to sort of expand on what they're showing us at this meeting that's an update? It seems, I mean, I, having looked at it myself just recently, it seems that the advantage to treating early with lenalidomide and dexamethasone in that particular study persists yes. uh, with longer follow-up. And right. it's, it shows a sort of um, a halving of the risk of developing active disease. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there were less deaths on the group of patients who received that combination therapy. But I think there were some questions about the number of deaths in the first place, Paul, was that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, my impression of the whole trial is that you know, clearly survival benefit was demonstrated. And if you looked at the control group, one of the most uh, striking features was the uh, frequency of skeletal events yep. um, leading to also uh, uh, mortality. So I think that in that context, um, I agree with Amrita, we have to be a little careful how we interpret that data. Um, because I think with advanced imaging, many of those patients would have been considered active disease. And obviously, um, we clearly really know that you need to treat active disease and survival benefit is, is well established with appropriate therapies. Um, so I think there's the, the principle of the trial is the point, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, that earlier intervention confers clinical benefit, and that, that's how I interpret it. Sad? No, I, I agree with you, and I, um, you know, one of the critiques of, of this study had been that you know, it was geared towards progression to active myeloma and, and not really powered for, for survival benefit. And that's where I think Sagar's study uh, will provide us with more information. The real debate between whether to treat or observe these patients, I think, will be settled. But then we'll have to figure out what is the best approach to treating these patients. So, so it, it's the, one of the debates that now comes up is, well, if you're going to treat them, shouldn't you treat them as you treat an active myeloma patient? And we have um, another abstract at this meeting from Dr. Langren and his colleagues. Uh, and Sagar, do you want to talk about that a little bit and what they did with the addition of carfilzomib to lenalidomide dexamethasone in this high-risk smoldering population? Yeah, so I think, you know, um, Ola's trial that they are updating at this meeting is sort of a natural progression of if lenalidomide and dexamethasone uh, doesn't do harm and may actually offer benefit to these patients, uh, what about giving more intensive therapy? And so he did a, a small trial looking at carfilzomib in combination with Lendex or KRD for patients with high-risk smoldering myeloma. And what I think he has nicely demonstrated is that almost all the patients achieved a response. A significant fraction after two years of therapy achieved stringent CR and achieved MRD negative complete remission that was durable after discontinuation of therapy at two years. And what, what I think is really intriguing about this, and he's presenting longer follow-up and that benefit has been sustained in a number of patients, is the idea that he gave very intense therapy and that he stopped at some point. 
because ultimately if we're going to treat these patients earlier, it's not just about reducing risk of complications, but potentially offering curative therapy. Uh, and, and I don't know that it's in the abstract, but do you think these patients will be cured? I don't know. I think it's really early to know the answer to that question. But so it's certainly there are subsets of patients that with three years follow-up now continue to be MRD negative uh, without being on therapy for over Which a year. Which is pretty exciting when you think yeah. about it, right? Yeah. You, these are people who are pre-symptomatic. Mm -hmm. You treat them aggressively. Their disease is completely gone and staying gone. I guess the question is how long for? How long? Right. right. Well, and I, yeah. I think in that vein, Keith, if I may, that I, I completely agree with Sagar. I think that the principle of earlier intervention to, to, to obtain durable clinical benefits clearly established. The immun immunological approaches in that setting are very important. And in our own group, we're studying this very actively with both antibody-based therapy as well as vaccination strategies. And the rationale there, of course, is that to Saga's point, you can have real memory effects in terms of the immune system that last for a prolonged period. So and at the same time, you minimize toxicity. This might be a really good place to intervene with immune-based therapies, which we'll, we'll get to later yeah. this morning. <laughs> um, just, um, just a little bit out left field, there yeah. was a paper published this year about the use of statin therapy in myeloma patients that's generated some discussion. This was a VA study, mm. a sort of retrospective look right. at people who took statins yes. or didn't take statins who got myeloma. Yep. What, what did that show, Paul? Well, it was very interesting. It was a large trial, about 5,000 mm -hmm. patients in the analysis. So the database is quite robust. Um, but clearly those patients who were on statins, either when their diagnosis was made or within three months of it, um, showed actually mortality benefit, which I think is fascinating. Mm -hmm. And you might say, why? Well, we do know the HM co-reductase pathway has some overlap with the amino bisphosphonate right. route. Yep. And interestingly, and this is what I found striking in that data, was actually there was a reduction in skeletal events which I thought was interesting. Right. So, um, and I think that pans into what we've just been discussing. Mm. For example, in smoldering patients, if they have any evidence of bone loss, we have a low threshold for amino bisphosphonate use. And there's some evidence that there's an immunological effect from amino bisphosphonates mm -hmm. emerging. So I think it's intriguing. Are and you going to uh, put all your patients on a stand then? Well, uh, you know, no, I would say that um, no, not necessarily. But why, having, why not then? Why, why um, wouldn't you? I'm struck that statins aren't without their price tag yeah. too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Proximal muscle weakness, <laughs> LFT abnormalities, one has to be a little careful. But having said that, if it's clinically indicated, why not? Anybody yeah. else going to use a statin r routinely or not convinced? If I can make a comment though, because generally, most people have hyperlipidemia, mm. it tends to go along with type 2 diabetes, mm. and certainly in that paper, based on that database, mm. they weren't able to sort out, but there is data, for example, in terms of metformin, right. and truly sort of reducing myeloma mm. progression, mm. mortality, and so I think it would be interesting to sort of deep delve deeper into that, and some, we're doing some of that work at our institution, and obviously we know that in terms of glucose, diabetes, IL-6, also drivers mm. of myeloma.